Well, hi guys, this is Darren with My RV Works. Welcome to another session of 10 Minutes with an RV Technician. And uh, basically, if you've seen several of these videos, you know the spiel. Uh, basically, we're collecting and, and harvesting all the questions that people ask us from all the different ways that they reach out to us. And we're throwing them in a big fishbowl and we're pulling out some questions. We've created a database where all the questions go in. We've got a whole team behind me that's helping put that whole thing together. And um, so let's jump into the first question. The first question is coming from Roger. And uh, Roger watched my video on um, an awning. I did an awning motor. And um, what Roger's question is, is what size are the rivets? And instead of rivets, could you use self-tapping screws? Okay, so Roger, overwhelmingly, the size of the rivets are gonna be 3 16 by one inch. Um, if you wanna get technical, Dometics are an inch and Lippert's are an inch and 5 16 and, and all this kind of stuff. Dometics are steel and Lippert's are aluminum and all this kind of stuff. So to the, your correct question, find out, you don't tell me what kind of awning you have, but, um, uh, but 3 16 rivet, um, about an inch long, and there's, uh, would be the, the answer. Um, but you could actually get the specific type of rivet uh, from the different manufacturer's spec, okay? Um, so that's the size. Now, could you use a self-tapping screw? I would not recommend using self-tapping screws in an awning. Um, it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. When you put a rivet in and it's properly inserted, it's not coming out um, unless you drill it out. Now, if you do a self-tapping screw, unless you're going to use th a thread locker or something like that, it is possible that that screw could work itself loose. Think about it. That awning on the motor side, it's always trying to fight. It's always fighting. There's a spring in there. It's always fighting that, that the hub that goes on the end, it's always fighting there. So you're going to have some fatigue going on through there. When when it's out and the wind's, bu it's always bucking it a little bit. So it is very possible that that screw could work itself loose. If you're going on the highway and the screw falls out, well, great. And I'm behind you. I'm going to get a flat tire. Gee, thanks a lot, Roger. I got a flat tire. But but um, the other thing is um, you don't want to be driving on the road and your screw falls out and I have a billowing awning flying around. So stick with the rivets is that one. Um, so hopefully I answer that question. The next question is coming from Ron. Uh, Ron, um, let's see, Ron watched my video on the automatic transfer switch. That was the one where we did that one for Techno RV. Eric and Tammy, great friends of ours, uh, they were up here visiting and um, uh, uh, Eric got an, um, an engineering sample for an automatic transfer switch and we put that in for him, made a video out of it. And it turns out that uh, the, the engineering sample was not working correctly. So we put the old, <laughs> automatic transfer switch back in. I was like, well, what was wrong with the first one? Well, it was a video. Just go with it. Read the comments. I've answered it a thousand times. But um, so um, Ron, uh, let's see, Ron wa worked at a, um, okay, yeah, Ron worked, at, he was working at an RV park and he did a lot of the electrical on the pedestals. And um, this RV park was for a mobile home pad and they could pull all the mobile homes out and put RVs in. And people were getting, he was getting reports that people were getting, um, 65 volts instead of 120 volts and um, they couldn't figure it out and what he found was that the uh, the, the 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 pedestals um, the, uh, apparently the way I interpreted the question was the the ground and the neutral were bonded in an R in the mobile home and they had a grounding rod right there and in the RV they didn't um, where I'm going with this whole thing is is the is um, really the importance of the neutral in the ground, that whole concept. We all understand the hot wire, the, 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 the black hot wire, uh, the, the one that's feeding all the power. We all understand that. But um, there seems to be some confusion on the neutral and the ground with respect to RV AC electrical circuits. Um, because it differs from the AC neutral and ground in a residential, commercial, or industrial setting. Um, in your house, your house isn't going anywhere. It's there, okay? So they drive that, what is it, an eight foot? God, when I was seven years old, my, I would work for my grandfather's electrician and I used to drive those things down to the ground. I had to climb up a ladder because I was too small and I'd hit it and hit it and hit it and hit it. That was my job, driving those ground rods into the ground. And then he'd come by in two hits, it's in the ground. And I'm like, uh. anyway, uh, that's the ground. It's, that's why it's called the ground. And um, so directly from that ground in your house or in your commercial building where the power meter base is and all the power comes into the building is where that ground needs to be. And um, so from there, you bring that ground wire with like a number six or something, bare wire right into the house, right onto the ground bus bar in your breaker panel, and you bond the neutral bus bar to the ground bus bar in your house and in your commercial buildings and things like that. Uh, that's the ground. 
all of a sudden we get in an RV, people do all these changes in RVs. Um, I've been in the electrical industry since I was seven years old. So I love you guys. I love my electricians, but, I, but there are times where I've come behind people that are certified licensed electricians, everything, and they worked on an RV and they bond the neutral in the ground in the panel, or they went to Lowe's and, or Home Depot, or I'm not ragging on those places, but, but uh, they got the, the council from there, but they're working on the RV and they bond the neutral in the bus. The neutral and the ground do not get bonded in an RV, period, full stop. Um, your homework assignment is go look in your, now if it was came from the manufacturer, it's good, but if, if it's a used RV or something like that, take off the cover, disconnect from power, and make sure that the neutral and the ground are not bonded together. The only place that the neutral and the bond, the neutral and the ground should be bonded together is not in the panel, okay? Then you're gonna plug it into your shore power, okay? So you have three separate wires, the, the hot, the neutral, and the ground going to your park pedestal, okay? The park pedestal is considered a sub base or a sub feed, okay? They should not be bonded at the pedestal. If you bond them at the pedestal, you might as well have bonded them at the uh, freaking RV, right? So you do not bond them at the pedestal, even though I have said in some of my previous videos, you bond it at the pedestal, but that's not correct because in my mind, pedestal is where the power comes from. So at the pedestal, there should be in that pedestal, three separate circuits, a ground circuit, a neutral circuit, and a um, power circuit. Those three circuits should be kept separate from each other all through the park, all the way back to where the power comes in from the utility. It is at that point where the power comes in from the utility where the ground goes to the ground, okay? If you don't do it that way, and every single pedestal has a ground dri stake driven into it, then through that ground, you're gonna have resistance. This one's driven into a piece of earth that's got a little bit of zinc in it. This one's driven into the earth that's got a little bit of manganese in it. This one's driven into the earth that's got a little bit of little quartz in it or, or lime or whatever. And so all these different elements throughout this entire RV park could have some play in the resistance through that ground wire and it's just traveling around through the thing, creating resistance. So one point of ground, period, okay? Um, so um, I took off of Ron's question because he had that problem at his RV park and I pulled off of his question. I wanted to really stress how important it was that the ground, now if you're at your house um, and you've got your little, uh, uh, little, but you got your 30 amp receptacle right there, well, that's connected to your house power and, and your, your ground is part of the house. It's not going anywhere, but in an RV park, you guys don't need to worry about what's going on in the RV park. That's an RV park's problem. Um, but I'm just telling you conceptually, that's what's going on there. One single point of ground. Okay, I've made that point. So I'm moving on to my next question. I'll finish up with this one. I got two minutes left. Um, so Steven has a question. I don't understand why an eight gauge wire from a tow vehicle, eight gauge wire is pretty big. Not quite the size of your pinky, but a pretty good size wire. I'm looking at my pin. Um, I don't understand why an eight gauge wire from the tow vehicle will charge a fifth wheel battery faster than the 16 gauge wire in the plug. Um, Okay, so the 16 gauge wire in the plug, I'm assuming the 16 gauge wire in the plug, is that the 16 gauge wire from the uh, tow vehicle through your pig, what, for your pigtail? Um, he talks about tow vehicle, okay. Um, and so basically you're talking about wire gauge size. Eight gauge is larger than 16 gauge by quite a bit. A 16 gauge is like what you might find on a little extension cord in your house running a little lamp or something. That's a small little wire. Um, they're rated for, I think, 10 amps. An eight gauge wire, I believe, that's a pretty good size wire. It's rated for 50 or 55 amps as an eight gauge wire. So what's an amp? That's the, 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 the moving electron. So think of it as an interstate, you know, like a, a five lane interstate or a four lane interstate with all the traffic going through it versus a little old country road or a gravel road. So the 16 gauge wire is like a gravel road and the eight gauge wire is like an interstate or, or something along like, I'm, I'm just trying to come up with a conceptually because some people when I talk about amps and volts and there's ah! so basically because the eight gauge wire is larger now I want to be clear on something I want to be very 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 clear on something it, there's more to this than just the gauge of the wire it has to do with what's feeding it if you've got a teeny tiny little battery charger just a little bitty trickle charger it wouldn't matter if it's coming through a 16 gauge wire or an eight gauge wire because it's sending the same amount of amps. But if you had a more substantial alternator or if you had a more substantial battery charger and it was able to put out 55 or 60 amps or something like that, then you would need the larger gauge wire so those electrons can actually move through it, okay? If you try to move 50 amps through a 
16 gauge wire, that wire is going to melt. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, so the bigger the wire gauge, the more electrons you can push through it, but that's only part of the story. You really need to ask the question, what am, what am I, so I've got my battery on this side, but what is pumping the electrons into the wire? Okay. So that's the other side of the question. And when you get into these electrical questions, everything needs to be balanced. Okay. Everything needs to be balanced where, uh, you got your battery, you got your wires connected to your battery. You've got your wire gauge that you've, you've got your battery charger. When we get into solar, a lot of people ask me to do, to help them with their solar calculations. Um, it's, it's, it, there is no infinite power supply in, in, in our, when we get into electron theory, we talk about a perfect power and a perfect this and a perfect, that's mathematical theory because it doesn't exist. There's imperfections in, in wire and zinc and stuff like that. Anyway, um, going on and on and on about that. So, uh, I'm out of time. My timer has timed down. So that finishes up this 10 minute session with the tech. So if this was helpful, thumb it up, subscribe, share it with your friends, uh, strongly consider joining us on our Patreon. That's where we're, we, like I said, I got people behind me that are really helping to put this whole thing together. Um, I want to compensate them. And so I'm asking you guys to help me to compensate them because I, I really want them to do good work. Anyway, until the next 10 minutes with the tech video, this is Darren signing off until the next time. See ya.